and now we're ready to put all the pieces together. So we have all of these little sort of chunks of information, different relationships and ideas, and we're going to make out of those the collage that's going to allow us to link microscopic principles, microscopic properties like energy levels and degeneracies, to macroscopic things like um, thermodynamic parameters, entropy, internal energy, and so on. All right, so to get started, the first thing that we need to do is pick a, ba a reference frame, all right? Later, we will learn that this is called an ensemble, which is that we fix, we have to find some variables to fix. So we're fixing volume, temperature, and number. Right? So kind of like if you had a fixed box of something at a, con at a given temperature. This tells us it's going to be the Helmholtz energy, which is our equilibrium determining thermodynamic potential. Okay, so the way we start out is we go back a little bit to when we, on the derivation of the Boltzmann distribution, where we argued that the internal energy would be given by basically the average of the energy. Right? And what average of the energy means, this is the energy that would depend on things like the volume and the number of particles, so it's embedded inside of here, okay? but it wouldn't depend on entropy and temperature. Remember we did that, and then we also said that if we look at changes in U, because number of particles and volume doesn't change, that that was going to kill off those terms. Okay, so we know how to calculate this. Basically, all we need to do is figure out the average, which we know how to do because we can use the equilibrium probabilities, the Boltzmann distribution, times the individual energy states. Right? And these individual energy states are those things that include all the, all the variables, including the number and the volume. Okay, so rather than thinking of this as like the individual states of a molecule, that's not what we're talking about. Right? We're talking about the individual states of the molecule and the fact that there's multiple molecules. All those states, kind of like the ones we listed last time when we had the degeneracies. Okay, or when we worked out the way to make the partition function for multiple particles. Okay, so when we do that, we put in here the, what we know will be the Boltzmann distribution for these populations, or these probabilities, right? And so we have the sum on j, and we have e to the minus ej, kt, times ej. And then we have our famous normalization factor, which is the Boltzmann, uh, sorry, the partition function. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to just do a little bit of some manipulations. First thing that we're going to do, it's purely for convenience at this point. We're going to define beta is 1 over kt. k is always a Boltzmann's constant, and it may later on in the course we'll use it for rate constants, but that's not, that's not happening now. Okay, and so that means we can just replace 1 over kt with beta. It saves a little bit of writing. There are some other reasons to do it. We introduce this as a new variable. It turns out some manipulations are more convenient to do uh, in terms of beta than in terms of 1 over temperature. Like if I want to take a derivative with respect to 1 over temperature, it looks a little bit nasty. But if I want to do a derivative with respect to beta, that's no problem. Right? Just that if we ever calculate anything, we have to put in 1 over temperature. Or if we get a result with beta, we can always switch it back to temperature. You'll, you'll see how it goes. It's not, too, it's not too surprising. OK, so because of this, we know what q is in this new notation, sum on j e to the minus beta um, ej. Right? So that's the partition function. So the first thing we want to do is ask ourselves, what is the beta derivative of q? Right? So we're going to ask, what's dq d beta? OK, and so well, you can look at it. Beta is the variable, so then ej with a minus sign is the thing that comes out of that. We do it by terms. So we'll have minus ej times e to the minus beta ej. OK? So what you'll notice then is that this looks a lot like this. Right? We have a minus sign that we have to deal with. OK? But it looks like, and it, you can, you know, convince yourself, and I'll try to convince you too, that u 
is equal to minus 1 over q. So the 1 over q we have, the minus comes from this. From taking the derivative of q, we get back, we get back everything we need for this term up here. Right? So make sure that that's clear. So that's d q d beta. All right, so what you see is that by simply taking a derivative of q with respect to beta, dividing by q and multiplying by minus 1, you achieve exactly the same formula. So this is just, that's just math, okay? But it's a convenient math uh, manipulation. One of the reasons why it's convenient is for the following. You may have learned about this, which you may not have. It doesn't take much more than knowing about derivatives. But imagine I have a function f of x, okay, and I consider the natural log of f of x. Sure, I can do that. And then I take the derivative of that. So d by dx of the natural log of f of x. So we know what that is, right? That's 1 over f of x times the derivative of f of x with respect to x. Okay, so this is just called a logarithmic derivative. And there are some reasons why it's convenient. One of the reasons is basically it comes down to if you have a bunch, if you're trying to take the derivative of something with a product of lots of terms, then you can compute the natural log of that, and then you can make your product into a sum, and then it makes the terms a lot easier. Here's an example of that. Imagine that you have a function f of x, and it's equal to u times v. So two different functions, u and v. If you follow along the rule, of course you can always do the normal product rule. So f primed of x will be um, u primed, so prime just means derivative with respect to x, vx plus ux v prime of x, which of course you know that. But let's look at taking the natural log first, okay? So if we do this, we have the natural log or the derivative of the natural log of f. We have the we have the formula, but we can also just write it down. So d by dx times the natural log of u times v, right? Which we know, of course, is equal to the the, nat the derivative of the natural log of u plus the natural log of v. Oops. So we can do this separately. So the derivative of the natural log of u of x, according to you know the rules here, is u primed of x divided by u plus um, v primed of x divided by v of x. Okay, and what is this equal to? This is equal to the, nat the derivative of the natural log of f. So that's 1 over f times df dx. So in other words, we can figure out the derivative of f by simply multiplying this derivative by f of x. Well, that's a convenient usage of the logarithmic derivative. Right? So what we're going to be doing is going back and forth. Um, there's a few reasons why you can imagine it might be useful here. First of all, we do have e's everywhere. All right? And we're also going to be making products of things. Okay? So knowing this sort of definition, you kind of see, oh, <laughs> that looks a lot like this, right? They're just different names. Instead of f, we have q, and instead of x, we have beta. All right, and so what we notice is that this is also equal to minus, so there's always this extra minus sign, right, because of the, the negative sign from the Boltzmann factor. But this is the same thing as the derivative of the natural log of q with respect to beta. Well, you can imagine situations where that would be more convenient versus the one versus the other. Okay, 
And so some other things that we can do that, are, that turn out to be very pra that turn out to be very practical is to look at beta itself. Remember, beta is one over kT. So um, what we might want to do is look at the temperature derivative of beta. Why might we want to do this? We might want to switch this derivative to being in terms of temperature instead of in terms of beta, right? So we need to figure out what's the factor to do that. And as you know, it's the you need to take the sort of the derivative of the, the two different terms. So here we have um, d beta dt is minus 1 over kt squared. Since these two are equal to each other, I can multiply this equation by either one of these terms. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the left-hand side by this one, and I'm going to multiply the right-hand side by this one over here. Okay, so we get minus 1 over kt squared times u is equal to d beta dt times minus d, the natural log of q, d beta. What do we see? The minus signs cancel. The, beta, the d betas cancel. And then we can put around the, we can put the, um, the u on one side, and then we'll have u is equal to kt squared times the logarithmic derivative of q with respect to beta. Okay, so we have a direct link now between the partition function, temperature, which is a parameter, and the internal energy. Okay, now you might think, why are we doing all this work? We could have just kept this simple formula here. Um, oops, I made a mistake again. So many mistakes. Very frustrating. The betas went away. So this should be temperature. Right? So we converted it to a derivative with respect to temperature. Usually temperature is the, the parameter that we're interested in, since it's a, the, the thing that we measure. But you could always invert the temperature. That's no problem. So sometimes you'll want it in terms of beta, sometimes in terms of temperature. It depends a little bit on what the goal is.